Welcome to the In His Grip podcast with Dr. Chuck F. Betters, produced by Mark Inc. Ministries. Let's join Dr. Betters in the sanctuary as he preaches the series, Building a Spiritual Legacy. And being the gentleman he is, I believe he has calmly backed out. Can we expect God to give us blessing and his protection if we demand that he leave us alone? Now, that's not a very popular message. And if I recall, Anne Graham was severely criticized for saying that. How could we dare believe that God somehow had a role in this terrible disaster? Yet we're warned in 2 Peter that that is coming. He tells us in verse 11, since everything will be destroyed in this way, here's the question you need to ask. What kind of people ought you to be? How you ought to live your life. How you should be holy and godly as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do other scriptures, to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory now and forever. Amen. The one thing I am convinced of when I study the Psalms, when I study the writings of the early church, One thing I am convinced of, whenever they write concerning the ungodly, whenever they write concerning the wicked, whenever they write concerning lawless and ignorant and foolish men, whenever they write of those who oppose the gospel message you and I hold dear, they always do so with one very important caveat. They always speak of the unsaved, the ungodly man's convictions. They are committed to what they believe. They hold tenaciously to their convictions, and they do not waver. Whenever they are dialoguing with those of us who claim that we have the truth, they will inevitably resort to name-calling. They will distort the facts. They will picket. They will mock. They will ridicule. They will yell. They will scream. And they will fight for what they believe in. The ungodly have convictions. But the godly, at times, lack convictions. We are too easy to give in and to give up. In the face of criticism, we bow down at their altar. Somehow or another, we say we believe in a God who is sovereign, who is Lord over all creation, who is weighing in the balance the deeds of men, who will one time, at one place, and in all of the climax of human history, he will bring every single man, woman, and child before his judgment seat. We say we believe that. But what does it take for us to sell out? What does it take for us to quit? I become increasingly concerned with some of our young people. I am saddened by what I see. Although there are many who are following after the Lord, it doesn't seem to take much for some of you to sell out. One of the things I try to do as a pastor is I try to stay in your world. I'm blessed in that I I have a son who basically does hands-on work with the young people in our church. So I'm able to dialogue with him as well as to do my own investigating. 
I am usually in the same ballpark as you are. Where you are going, what you are doing, and what you are saying. I try to make that a very, very important part of who I am and what I do. But listen closely. I visit the same websites you're on. I'm reading your websites. I've passworded myself in, and I dial you up, and I want to see what my young people are saying. I want to see what you believe. I'm looking at your pictures. I'm watching you in poses that are anti-Christ. I'm listening to you in the profiles try to pass yourself off as some sort of foul and vile and ignorant person. I'm watching you. And then when I further read your profile and they talk about, well, what do you believe? What is your faith? You put Christian. No, you're not. No, you're not. Christians don't sell out the way you have. No, you're not. You just think you are. The sad part is that you come here to clear your conscience. You think that by going to church, maybe going to the youth program, fellowshipping with some of your friends, saying praise the Lord or I love Jesus or throwing a log into the fire on a retreat makes you a Christian. I want to tell you something. Listen closely, young people. The days of that kind of simplistic Christianity are over. It is going to cost you a lot more to take your stand. Some of you are involved with young men and young women who don't want to have anything to do with Christ, and you say you love them. You are on fire, and you are heading for destruction. And those around you who warn you are warning you because they love you. But you have bought in to the da Vinci mindset. You have bought in to this philosophical mindset that says it's not really true. Everything you believe is not true. That what really counts is how happy you are. Now the sad part is, The sad part is that many pastors in their churches are teaching you just that. They're teaching you that what really matters is your self-image, how happy you are, whether or not you've got joy. This is arrogance. This is an arrogance that Psalm 10 tells us characterizes the ungodly. The problem is, many of us, many of you, have embraced the same personalities and characteristics of the arrogant man of Psalm 10. Take a look at it with me. He says, for example, in verse 2, in his arrogance, the wicked man hunts down the weak who are caught in the schemes he devises. You see, the arrogant man is arrogant toward those who have less than he does, and he schemes to take from them what they have. They jump at the opportunity to make your sorrow greater. Name-calling and lies become commonplace. Spiritual plots to bring you down increase with every one of your questions and doubts. And do you know where it usually originates? By the unbeliever saying this, Does God really say... Let me tell you, parents, some of your kids are struggling with self-image. It's typical. Teenagers struggle with it all the time. They want to feel accepted. And the arrogant person stands out in front of them and senses that. They know that that person is struggling, and they'll say the right things to get them to do the wrong things. Sadly, some of your children are caving, and they're caving quickly. And even more sadly, is some of you parents have actually encouraged it. You think it's cute. Well, it's not cute. It's arrogance. Look at verse 3. He boasts of the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy. He reviles the Lord. You see, this arrogant man is proud of his moral and spiritual rebellion. He prides himself in the fact that his chin is jutted out against God, that he's hardened in his position. I am a rebel. I think for myself. No one's going to rule over me. 
I am no one's property. I will bow to no man's leadership. I am who I am, and I'm proud of it. This is arrogance. The wicked man acts upon what is already in his heart and according to his nature. Verse 3 says, he boasts of the cravings of his heart. He blesses the greedy. He reviles the Lord. In other words, he wants to be friends with the greedy. And he doesn't want the greedy to know that he serves a living God. God is placed over here in some sort of corner, and then he wonders why, when he or she is in trouble, that God has hidden his face. The very destruction of New Orleans, the very destruction of that vile, vile city, we're almost spitting right back in God's face. Even recently, when they stood up and said, what's most important is that we have Mardi Gras. We're just going to go back and do everything that we did before. It's like God fired a warning shot and nobody heard it. Nobody heard it. May I suggest to you as I read 2 Peter chapter 3, the one we read this morning, what is coming to this earth will make Katrina look like Disney World. This is but the mere beginning of sorrows. And the lines are going to be clearly drawn. Those on one side and those on the other are going to be clearly marked. Verse 4 tells us that this man is so full of himself. In his pride, the wicked man does not seek God. In all his thoughts, watch this, there is no room for God. My mind is filled with other things. And that's exactly where Satan wants you. So full of yourself that there is virtually no room for God. Full of pride, full of arrogance, full of things, pleasures, power, acceptance, fame, happiness. I heard a preacher this morning, I've told you in the past, this theology, not necessarily this pastor, although I believe he's one of them. These are people who are Christians. These are Christians. And I got to tell you, in the early church, let me back up for a minute. In the early church, do you know that Peter and Paul fought with each other? Do you want to know the two greatest saints of the church fought? You know what it was over? Peter was sitting down having a meal with Gentiles. But when he saw the Jews coming by, he stood up and walked away so that the Jews would not see him eating with Gentiles. His bigotry was still evident. This is a Christian who was a bigot. The Apostle Paul observed all of this and he chastised Peter. He chastised Peter. One of the greatest Christians who ever lived chastised one of the greatest Christians who ever lived because he was a bigot. Just because we err does not mean we're not Christians. I'm not saying for one moment that these people are not Christians, but I want you to ask this question. What if Paul had allowed that to go unchecked? What if in Acts 15, when the church wondered about the inclusion of the Gentiles, and they held the first presbytery meeting, what would have happened if they had decided Gentiles are inferior people. Only Jews can be saved. Doctrinal error can happen even within the church. The Colossian Christians were worshiping angels, believing that mediaries were needed. This was Gnosticism, pure and simple. The recipients of John's writings were struggling with the deity of Christ. The Hebrew Christians were wondering whether or not the fire was worth it all, and they wanted to quit. Christians struggle with truth. Christians struggle with all these things that are in their minds. But let me tell you what's so dangerous. It's the theology that teaches this. What really matters is that you're happy. What really matters is that you're happy. 
And if there's anybody or anything in your life that hinders your happiness, you need to extract that so that you are happy. And that's exactly how some of you kids are thinking. What really matters is how happy I am. It doesn't matter what the truth is. There's no room in this clogged up brain for God. There's no room. And because of that, verse 5 tells us, this man has no moral compass. His ways are always prosperous. He is haughty and your laws are far from him. He sneers at all of his enemies. Thank you for listening. For the complete sermon, please visit markinc.org and click In His Grip. Join Dr. Chuck F. Betters in the sanctuary from Monday to Friday on the In His Grip podcast.